The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Mike Willette with the Intertribal Council of Michigan's National Native Network. Welcome to our NNN webinar series on cancer risk reduction in Indian Country. This webinar is titled The Diné Food Service Movement. Your presenter today is Gloria Ann Begay, core member and volunteer with the Diné Community Advocate and Educator. Uh, she has a Master of Arts in Education Administration from Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff and a Bachelor of Science in History and Education from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Funding for this webinar was made possible by the CDC and no commercial interest support was used to fund this activity. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to understand the indigenous concept of health and impact of Diné food issues and policies, develop a food environment movement plan that reflects local community needs and culture, and identify health and food system outcomes as food hubs, tribal food policies, and more. And now at this time, I will throw it over to Gloria Begay. Thank you, Mike, for organizing this webinar and the opportunity to share some information and ideas about what uh, Navajos are doing out in Navajo country regarding, you know, changes in the um, food system and developing food policies in all different areas and aspects of Navajo life. Um, and so I just appreciate um, the opportunity to share this um, information and it entails a lot of partners. And so it's just not, you know, me speaking as Gloria Ambigay, but, you know, as a lot of different people working endlessly on the issues of uh, food insecurity and addressing issues of um, health problems, you know, in Indian country. Um, introducing myself formally, uh, Gloria Ambigay Shienshia, Twitch Eatni, A and Schlit, Touch Eatni, A Bushes Chain, Lizathlena Ada Shiche, Ado, Tobaha Ada Shinella. So those are my clan families. And I have a home out at Inscription House, Arizona. Uh, I'm currently um, doing some uh, help on health care here in Albuquerque with a dear friend and um, still doing my meetings and training though with um, the food movement. Um, with that introduction, I wanna go ahead and move to the next slide. And we covered the learning objectives so we'll keep moving on to other areas of the presentation. Okay, on my slide called the journey to Hojon. What we try to do at the beginning of our projects, you know, when we're doing presentations with schools or with communities or, you know, with organizations that want to partner with us, um, we share this particular um, image of a man with the corn in, in the inside of his body. And this particular picture was um, developed developed by uh, one of our uh, Navajo practitioners. And he was commissioned to do a series of these art paintings uh, with the Navajo NASA program. And the bottom line to this picture, we do a picture analysis and we have students and um, attendees analyze the picture and we ask the question, you know, what is, what is this story about? why is this man in this middle of this picture? And what are all these um, spirals and um, even some words? And 
so the people do an, an analysis. They talk about, well, I see the four sacred mountains. You know, I see Father, Son, um, the Mother Earth, the moon, the eagle feathers, uh, du duality of the male and the female concepts. And uh, we want to make an awareness that, you know, we have a holistic concept of health. And this entails not only people being healthy, but our environment needs to be in healthy so that everything is healthy in a balanced and harmonious process. And this concept is also in our um, Navajo Fundamental Laws. It's the first um, chapter in our series of Navajo government laws. And it tells the responsibility of how Navajos need to take care of themselves, their families, their communities, and they are the stewards of the environment. They have to be the caretakers. And they are given the special gifts and talents of intelligence, five fingers, um, you know, the ability to create, to solve problems, to make decisions, and so on like that. So um, this journey is a journey that Navajos believe we we can live up to 102 years. And uh, currently though, we have a lot of issues that uh, many of our Navajo people, you know, are not making <laughs> that goal of 102 years old. So anyway, this is just kind of a brief overview of us being um, healthy of our mind, body, spirits, and emotions, and taking care of everything and everyone in our environment. And this goes back to, you know, also our history. And we encourage, you know, tribal people to look back at your history and start thinking about, well, when did things change on my uh, reservation? How has it um, impact what we're doing in the current contemporary life today? And we get reminded about, you know, the um, historical trauma issues that we have faced. However, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Navajo Vice President Jonathan Nez, and he reminds us that, you know, while we've had all these traumas um, that have affected the way you know things have changed in uh, Navajo culture and even our language, um, we need to understand and be mindful that you know we are people that can you know always work to be happy and healthy, and you know we can make the changes if there are uh, obstacles and problems out there. So we've all made up our mind. Um, that we're going to keep moving forward, even though we've we have a lot of different problems, you know, in our social, economic um, issues on the reservation. Um, and maybe I better go back and just say that um, that last map had the picture of the Navajo Long Walk, and people don't realize that. This long walk, you know, was um, really long. I mean, we walked from Arizona into the middle of New Mexico. There were very different kinds of paths, some that went up into Santa Fe, some that dropped down south. Um, the Mescalero Apaches were imprisoned with us at Fort Sumner, and 1,200 Navajos had died after um traveling through Fort Sumner and having illnesses and sicknesses, lack of food and um, different things that happened to them um, when we were imprisoned. Um, and in 1868, when we signed the Navajo Treaty, this was our reservation and it goes into New Mexico and Arizona. And so we were allowed to live in this area you know, legally. However, um, the next map shows that, you know, our reservation expanded now to 27,000 square miles. 
and it goes up into Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And uh, folks need to know that, you know, dealing with this huge land base, um, it's a wonderful resource though for us. And there's a lot of us Navajos there. So Economic Development Division tells us, well, those are our two real big, you know, pluses for Navajo Nation. We have a lot of land, we have a lot of people. And I wanted to point out um, this map shows um, the abandoned uranium mines on Navajo. And as uh, community advocates, we learned that we got to learn what are the real deep issues into our food and health problems. And so we look at our environment and when we know we have more than a thousand abandoned mines on Navajo, um, those have contaminated land, uh, water, um, livestock, and then we're eating some of that stuff as Navajos and we're seeing a lot of cancer patients, of course, diabetes and heart attacks and all kinds of, kinds of other issues. And I wanted to also point out that um, the, um, the Navajo junk food tax advocate folks, you know, call the Diné Community Advocacy Alliance. We began with working with IHS on Navajo area and they gave us some um, um, staff to help us, resources, training money. Um, all of the eight service units on Navajo provided um, a lot of, um, you know, these resources to help us as advocates to move forward in um, our legislative recommendation of the Navajo junk food tax. So, you know, this was 110 communities um, that we were working on on this big reservation. Historic perspective, um, due to Indian policies, you know, that really impacted um, problems on Navajo and with other um, Indian groups, um, the Scorch Earth campaign, they burned out, you know, orchards, um, cornfields, they starved us out of our communities way back before the treaty was signed. And then of course we were imprisoned. And then after imprisonment, we were allowed to go back to our homeland, which was a, a victory for us because a lot of other tribes never got that privilege of returning to their original homelands. And the importance of um, land to um, native folks is that um, we, we as Navajos live within our four sacred mountains and that set the boundaries for us to focus on this particular land base, know all the plants and animals, the geographic terrain. It showed us our challenges and it showed us our um, abilities and opportunities to keep that land, you know, um, healthy and help produce, you know, the food we needed and so on like that. So, um, you know, the land base for Indian people is so important. The next big Indian policy that we faced, of course, was Indian education. And everyone knows, kill the Indian, save the man. And so at that point on, a lot of um, Indian people were sent into boarding schools. Um, as Navajos, we were uh, sent all the way to Carlisle Indian School way back in Pennsylvania in the 1890s. So a lot of Indian people started changing their culture because of these boarding schools. And then our way of life and then our food system started changing. Um, then the introduction of trading posts, bringing in new kinds of foods. Um, then the first store that showed up on Navajo was in 1968, actually. And then just a few years ago, CDC and Navajo government did a, a food study of stores of near 100 stores on Navajo and found that 80 to 90% of the foods in those stores were um, junk food, soda pop and potato chips, no fruits and vegetables, um, meats. And so, it, you know, they're very poorly um, stocked with good food. And Navajos don't have a choice then, you know, and having access to good food. Uh, then we've got the supplemental foods like SNAP, uh, commodity foods, uh, WIC, and so on like that. And those are supplemental foods that, you know, help a lot of Navajos that don't have maybe jobs or, or access to um, 
good food. And those are supposed to help us from the federal government um, programs. And then, as I mentioned before, we've gone through a cultural shift by uh, Western education. And that has really um, made some huge changes in um, Indian country. And I know on Navajo, it's disappointing, you know, we're having language, Navajo language loss. Um, some of our kids don't even know how to go to the chapter house and vote. Um, there's, you know, really inadequate um, curriculums in Navajo history, Navajo government, Navajo astronomy. And um, so we're losing, you know, really the indigenous knowledge that has, you know, um, preserved our people for, for centuries. Um, then also um, the introduction of um, Western energy companies coming into Indian country. Um, we've, as Navajo, um, have had a lot of uh, uranium and coal extractions. Uh, while it made money for the uh, nation, um, it still has been calling environmental pra uh, practices that are now depleting our water system, contaminating our land, contaminating our water, and so on like that. Fracking is going on. Um, there's water issues, uh, land jurisdiction issues, um, BIA uh, land grazing permit, and um, all these land regulations are hindering our farmers and ranchers. Um, there's poverty, you know, as high as 90% um, unemployment in some of our communities. So there's a lot of challenges um, out there that we're trying to uh, work on. Um, there's a, a partner that we work with, um, the COPE project, and they're the Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment Project. They're a nonprofit organization, they're new. Um, but they did get a nice big CDC grant and they hired Harvard Food Law Policy Clinic to do a 90 page, what they're calling a food toolkit. And so um, they talk about the traditional uh, Navajo food um, system and foods. Um, they talk about the structure of Navajo government, the role of federal and state government regarding food, uh, food production um, issues and recommendations. Um, other parts of the system of food processing and so on like that. And then um, they do offer some suggestions on how to access more healthy food, um, talking about the food assistance program, and then a nice section on the school food and nutrition education um, topic. And so um, there's two things happening on Navajo right now. We're taking a look at um, um, restoring the Navajo food system in the more traditional form, but yet, you know, using contemporary resources. And then also looking at what they call the farm to school activities and policies. How can we get better school lunches, maybe do school gardens, uh, do wellness um, policy councils in the schools and even communities. BIE is good in that they um, mandated all of their schools to have wellness councils and wellness policies developed. Um, there's an, a nice chart, oh, excuse me. There's a nice chart in that booklet called Role of Government and Food Policies. So it does a nice comparison of the food safety, um, maybe policies at the federal, state, local um, Navajo government level and at the local chapter house level. And so those have some good information in terms of, you know, what's what's there, um, what's lacking, um, what's duplicating and so on like that. So that was a nice um, chart that was available for us to view as we're moving forward to making our own Navajo food policies. Um, a basic food system, you know, entails um, how do you produce food? Uh, how does it look in terms of health and traditions? Um, the processing and preserving of foods, distribution and waste recovery of food, and then access and consumption. And this, these 
uh, com components, you know, uh, make up the sustainable local food system. And so as we're developing um, this um, restoration of the Navajo food system, these are the components we're looking at. The next uh, slide shows, um, you know, USDA has been doing their uh, food desert study across the United States. And this, of course, is the Navajo Nation map. And it's just looking like 95% of our Navajo reservation is living in a food desert. And of course, we define a food desert as having people not having access to quality and affordable food. So we have some huge issues of food insecurity on Navajo. And when I was um, director of the Navajo Washington DC office, we had to always chime the statistics of what's going on on Navajo. And at the time, uh, we only had, Navajo's only had 2,000 miles of paved roads on Navajo. And look, it's the size of West Virginia. And so we have a lot of dirt roads um, and that causes a lot of transportation problems, not only for the people, but for vendors coming in and um, issues of, you know, um, food turning bad by the time they get up into the interior of the reservation and so on like that. So that becomes another um, major issue in food security. Um, oh dear. Okay, and then this is our um, original community advocacy um, organization. And we began our work back in 2012. Um, and it was composed, like I said, of volunteers around the reservation and IHS staff. And um, our vision was to improve the quality of life. And we wanted to see if we couldn't get um, community wellness projects by um, asking the Navajo Council to impose um, a food tax on junk food. And um, it created um, a real wide uh, public health awareness, you know, with this um, uh, junk food tax initiative. Uh, we had to do a lot of uh, research. Um, we went in the internet, we um, talked with hospitals, stores, um, of course, legislators, um, all kinds of different organizations that were supposed to be in the different health fields. And um, just one of our key iceberg images, um, 25,000 Navajos with diabetes. Um, and then yet underneath um, 75,000 being pre-diabetic you know, with the potential of becoming diabetic. So those, you know, uh, kinds of data um, was a wake up call to everybody that, you know, we've got a, a big problem on Navajo. And like I said, we had other kinds of statistics. Um, the four leading um, deaths on Navajo come from one, number one, their accidents. Second one is heart disease and strokes. Um, the third is diabetes and the fourth is cancer. And then all the side issues of blindness, amputations, um, dialysis treatment, um, depression, and so on like that. So there's all these side um, complications that you know are impacting um, the health of the people. Uh, when we started our um, legislation movement, uh, we worked very, very closely with the council. And it, we really want to commend um, uh, former delegate Danny um, Simpson for um, accepting the challenge of presenting the tax food legislation to the council. And so with his help, he was able to bring in the legislative um, attorneys to help write the legislation, bring in um, like our um, Navajo Health Division, um, Navajo Tax Com Commission, um, meetings you know, with the council, the standing committees, the um, president and vice president at the time, and um, 
after we did a lot of work with the council, we met with 20 standing committees of um, health and education, law enforcement, um, uh, budgets, and then um, um, the resources. So we had four standing committees. We met with them 20 times and six times with the full council. And so it was really a process of educating and educating. Um, like I said, here's kind of like the uh, brief overview of the process. Uh, we did research and gather data. We had the Navajo government meetings and meetings with other organizations. We took a lot of advocacy training, training on the Navajo tax system, Navajo legislative system, um, you know, what's going on with our stores, what's going on with our food systems. So it was a lot of um, training. Uh, we did um, local resolutions. Um, we went to about 51 chapters and gained um, support uh, resolutions to take to the council. And it was also uh, important that um, these folks got, you know, a um, little bit of education on the health status. And when they got that little bit of information, they became aware of the problems. And so we really, um, I think we only had like um, two chapters that tabled um, our resolutions. And so, you know, we had to do a lot of work in terms of uh, local training, um, local travel. I mean, I know on my truck, I put on 30,000 miles um, each year for the last three years, um, doing all this traveling to the different communities. Uh, we met, of course, with the um, council committees and the full council many different times. Um, and then, uh, of course, the president had to approve the legislation. Um, the former um, Navajo president, um, Shelley, um, uh, vetoed the um, food tax on junk food, and we had to kind of like start all over again. And um, with Nota Begay, the Thirds Help, and the American Heart Association and other groups, First Nations Development, of course, they helped us um, um, go back to the council and um, override um, Shelley's veto. And so it was just recently we got the legislation passed. And now we're in the implementation stages and um, all of our communities, um, have access to the 2% um, um, tax revenues for the first three months of the um, implementation of the law. We gathered near $2 million in the first three months. And so from every year now until 2020, these communities will have access to their 2% tax revenues and they can um, develop their community wellness projects and if you see the legislation, there's all kinds of um, uh, different kinds of projects that they can um, implement. So there's two food tax legislations that were passed, um, the 2% on unhealthy food and sugar sweetened beverages. And um, then it not only is, you know, taxing at the stores, but it's also in the restaurants, hotels with snack bars. Um, and so on like that. And so all the revenues will go back to the 110 chapters for community wellness projects. And so that became effective April 1st, 2015. And then the council will review it in 2020 to see if we are going to continue the 2% um, tax um, on junk food. And as advocates, um, it wasn't so much the money as it was the message. And we went round and round. Um, some communities said one half percent, some said 1%. The council said 1% and we had to go round and round and at least fight for 2%. But in our studies across the uh, United States, they were telling us you need to charge at least 8% to make any kind of effective impact on the change of people's habits of uh, buying unhealthy food. And um, and as you all heard, Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico just lost another 
um, tax on sugary sweetened food um, I mean beverages. And they came to us when we had um, been working on the 2% tax and they said, well, when you pass your, your tax, come and help us in Santa Fe. And they said, we've already lost seven times, but we did not have the time. We still are, um, you know, really working um, a lot with, with our communities so that they are developing and planning and spending their 2% revenues on their community projects. Now, the other tax that was passed is zero tax on uh, fresh fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and nut butters. And this was to encourage the purchasing and consumption of healthy foods. And this became effective in October 1st, 2014 in retail businesses. And so that means that on Navajo, we charge a 5% tax on everything that you know people buy in the stores, if you're a vendor, um, if you know any kind of retail businesses. And so that was um, kind of a push to um, get people to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, our process, I explained that just a minute ago. I don't know if my slide's going back up. Oh, there you are, sorry. Um, I had mentioned the wellness projects, and here's some examples. It could be even uh, healthy environments, looking at waste management, looking at um, clean water. It could be even like education, uh, libraries, health cooking, nutrition classes, uh, biking, hiking, walking trails. And then, of course, our big success is with IHS is just move it, the runs um, and the T-shirts and celebrations in the communities to get out and get physical activities going. Um, you could even ask for a swimming pool, but you know, the funds aren't gonna be much. Um, wellness centers, um, school gardens, community gardens, um, improve stores with the encouragement of more fruits and vegetables, uh, native traditional foods, um, and even going into um, uh, farmer marketing, um, reintroducing traditional foods, traditional gardening, and so on like that. It could even include um, equine therapy, health coaching, getting youth clubs going, uh, food processing, preservation, setting up cooperatives. Um, there's just so much um, that is very open to um, wellness projects in the communities. Uh, there is though one exclusion of education we have so many of our tribal members running off to conferences and only one person really benefits in that effort. So we decided that the training and workshops in the communities is accept uh, acceptable, but you can't just have one person run off to a health conference because it only benefits one person. So, um, you know, education, outside education and training conferences are, are not acceptable. And there's some other things too, but it's all outlined in a, a very detailed piece of legislation. Um, we have a lot of different partners working on the food system and uh, food projects. Um, one of our uh, great partners is again, COPE. Um, they're doing other um, activities like um, accessing healthy foods by um, working with the Navajo stores, um, introducing and um, uh, encouraging traditional foods, um, using maybe local farmers uh, for their, their um, produce. Um, and then the F and B means um, the fruit and vegetables um, prescription program. And that's where um, if a, a, like a family of four agrees to a six month project of health um, at an IHS clinic or maybe hospital and they're working with COPE, they can get um, kind of like food coupons to um, buy fruits and vegetables, you know, at no cost to the family. And then they're kind of like measured to see, you know, if they're um, maybe losing some weight, uh, changing their eating habits and so on. Um, of course, they're looking at helping with the Navajo Food Policy Toolkit 
and um, setting up food councils. They're doing outreach and doing food literacy, um, traditional food cooking demos. And um, then we have links, of course, to our communities, um, working with um, our clinics, with um, CHRs, doing health education, using our Happy Homes curriculum, and um, in hopes of reducing obesity and other chronic diseases. Um, of course, our new uh, nonprofit organization, uh, the Neh Food Sovereignty Alliance, is working hard to restore traditional foods and traditional food system based on um, traditional values and practices, um, using traditional the Neh leadership models, and looking at issues from um, our um, indigenous perspectives, and then we coordinate and gather partners to support projects and um, good policies. Uh, when we're looking at um, building, um, you know, a better local economy in the food system arena, we're looking at maybe doing like a food hub and having our local Navajo uh, gardeners and producers um, provide their produce to like Navajo Head Start our FACE programs, um, the senior citizen centers, their lunch programs, encouraging maybe even um, gardens at the senior centers at Head Start, um, having the local um, uh, schools and having school gardens um, accessible to um, fresh fruits and vegetables and local farmers providing uh, local produce to school programs. And then, of course, um, Navajo gardeners providing produce to stores and maybe um, the chapter setting up community um, center cafes. So there's um, an economy developing around food. And the only issue that, well, there's a lot of different issues, but the main issue of uh, encouraging food hubs is still some issues with lack of water out there on Navajo. And so this, you know, becomes a real big problem. And then people becoming just so sedentary now that, you know, they're um, not wanting to maybe go out and have a, um, a garden or reopen their farms and ranches. Um, another study that has just come out recently is calling Feeding Ourselves. Uh, food access, health disparities, pathways to healthy native communities. And some of their recommendations is to get um, um, tribes to control their SNAP and WIC and commodity foods, um, support um, tribes with, um, you know, policies to uh, mandate more water, um, better um, land um, regulations, um, hunting and so on like that and then uh, producing local markets for healthy foods, um, doing farm to school um, activities, uh, labeling foods, you know, with the healthy um, nutritional values. There's um, looking at helping with policies are needed for tribal programs, for schools, senior, set in, senior centers, so on. And then um, even, of course, the healthy, having a health, unhealthy food tax um, supporting um, native producers um, with entrepreneurship, with agriculture training, education, mentors, uh, internships, um, uh, doing um, community food assessments, um, tribal food uh, policies, um, partnering with non-tribal groups for food system help. So it does take a lot of um, energy it takes a lot of partners because it's actually kind of like going back and looking at all the different components in your culture and food has a connection with all of it so we're trying to go back and restore you know um, traditional food systems and the foods back into our tribal um, communities um, in closing, um, 
I have some summary statements, but before doing that, there's one important um, item that um, I wanted to mention, and I um, thank the San Carlos Apache uh, group for contacting me last week and asking me to maybe help them with um, their uh, plans to um, develop a unhealthy food tax. And it's that as community advocates, we really did some really deep training in how do you work with policymakers and policy um, leaders such as tribal council delegates and state legislators. And we were trained to do power mapping, um, power messaging. And we analyzed, you know, who are these decision makers? Who are these individuals? What are their likes and dislikes? Why are they not voting with us? And so we had to do all these kinds of mapping and um, discussions and analyzing. And then once we had that information, we started assigning each of us advocates. Will you work with so and so delegate on this particular issue? Ask why you know he's not voting with us. And yet we we behind the scenes you know <laughs> found out why they're not voting for certain kinds of things. And so, you know, it was a lot of um, training education in understanding how to work with um, tribal government, their process, and then working with individual legislators and tribal leaders, both um, elected and also appointed. So that's a very key ingredient in terms of moving like a, a tax legislation. So anyway, in closing, just that, you know, um, it's it would be well for tribes to consider using their indigenous values and um, doing a food movement based on those indigenous values. And remember, we can't do it all alone. It's a culture shift. So educators, economists, um, the health um, folks, um, legislators, everyone has to help in this um, change to better food and a better food system. And it starts with education in our schools, our communities, with our tribal leaders. And um, don't forget to use existing resources and programs at the tribal, state, federal, and private sector levels. Everyone can help in, in this issue. And on Navajo, we have so many partners. Our Diné College, um, Navajo Technical University, land grant programs, um, university continuing ed programs, a lot of nonprofit um, um, organizations out on Navajo really trying to help um, do all different aspects of what is needed in a good healthy um, food um, system. And then of course, um, these tribal programs need to look at their communities and listen to their community members because it has to be community based and it needs to be culturally relevant. Because, you know, um, if you hear that term, putting a square peg into a round hole, um, you can't force people to make changes that they really don't want or is not relevant to their communities. On Navajo, we have like little urban towns that may have a couple of stores and, you know, an economy going with lots of jobs. And yet we have another community that only has maybe a chapter house and a school and um, they don't have maybe running water. So all the communities are different in different ways. So uh, it's best to work with um, communities on what their food system needs. And then also analyze um, the government policies and the funding sources and any impacts, uh, any impacts on um, the environment or the people, like I mentioned, the uranium mines and um, government policies. I know we have a lot of complaints up on Navajo with um, the BIA grazing permits and then land regulations. And you can't even do a garden in the Navajo um, housing authority um, areas. So, you know, really take a look at um, government policies. So um, this concludes my presentation. And I, um, again, thank um, IHS and Michael for um, setting up and arranging this um, 
um, opportunity to present some information. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Gloria. Um, if anybody has any questions, we'll go ahead and do a uh, short question and answer period here. Um, if you'd like to contact Gloria, feel free to, um, I guess, uh, shoot her an email or her contact number is on the screen. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, type your questions into the question box into the GoToWebinar platform on your screen. Um, there should be a question box there. Type your question in, and I'll go ahead and ask it to Gloria, and Gloria will uh, respond aloud for everybody to hear. <clears throat> for those uh, looking to follow the National Native Network on social media, uh, you can uh, look us up on Facebook, on Twitter, and on LinkedIn. Also, uh, make sure you follow us on keepitsacred.org for folks that you know that may have missed today's webinar. We will archive the webinar. Uh, it should be up within the next 24 hours, but knock on wood, hopefully I'll get it up today. So uh, hopefully I'll have it up here in the next hour. Um, but if not, within the next 24 hours for sure. Also, tomorrow we'll be uh, sending out a survey and evaluation on how we did on the webinar. Um, for this webinar, we will not be offering uh, continuing education units um, from the IHS Clinical Support Center, unfortunately. Um, we uh, Typically we do, but for this one we, uh, we were unable to. So, um, but if you still wanted to offer your, uh, your feedback, your evaluation, um, we will be sending out a survey tomorrow for that. Um, so otherwise, yeah, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to type them in, into the question box here. Um, this, per this first person simply just had a comment that also con contaminated water is another issue to promote gardening in that area. Um, I don't know if you had anything else to add on that, Gloria. Oh, yes. Um, in dealing with contaminated water, yes, that's a really big issue because uh, we decided as um, uh, the DSFA group to um, join the Nota Begay Foundation's Water Quality Project. And um, it's called Water First. And nine um, tribes have um, small water grant um, projects to address the issue of maybe, um, you know, how do we encourage our, our tribal people to uh, stop drinking soda pop and switch to water. And some of the other questions though that have come up is that, you know, well, how do we do water testing then? And then if we find that there's bad water in our community, um, you know, who do we go to to um, uh, work on getting the water cleaned up or um, maybe accessing another source of water to come into the communities? And so it's raised a to me, a lot more questions and it has um, some solutions. Um, but our good friend um, out at Star School, Dr. Sorensen, um, is um, doing a, a project to bring in a water filtering system. And he wants to promote it and, you know, um, have that filter system available to other communities if they, they want it. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of issues dealing with that contamination of, of water. And um, it's going to take a lot of people to address that. And I know just with the topic of water on Navajo, um, looking at the lack of water, we set up even um, a Navajo water team to work with um, Navajo President Russell Begay and Vice President Nez to do better water negotiations. Um, for our tribal f farmers and uh, gardeners and livestock owners and communities. So yeah, th the water is a very critical issue. Absolutely. Well, I'm still waiting on uh, folks to see if they have any questions. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the question box on your GoToWebinar platform. Um, also, uh, by the end of this week, we should be sending out a um, 
a uh, National Native Network newsletter. If you haven't signed up for our mailing list yet, you can go to keepitsacred.org, click on the Contact Us page, and uh, there's a form right there that you can fill out to go ahead and uh, sign up for our newsletter, and we'll go ahead and hopefully have that distributed by the end of the week this week. This next person asks, I understand NAU is planning to do a study on the effectiveness of the HDNA. Are there any other plans to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the act at the tribal policy level? Um, as far as I know, I think the um, uh, NAU is going to be looking at the, um, the policy level. And I do know um, there are some organizations within Navajo, um, particularly like uh, the COPE organization is doing a lot of work with stores. And um, we have asked um, Vice President Nez if uh, we could meet with um, like all the stores on Navajo and make sure they understand how to apply the um, 2% junk food tax or the waiver of the 5% on uh, healthy foods and um, to make sure they um, are doing the correct calculations because I know that was another big question that, um, you know, some of these stores, you know, do the handwritten stuff or some use uh, sophisticated, um, you know, computerized um, systems and they do coding, of course, of um, the foods and stuff. And so I know we've worked um, um, many meetings with like bashes on Navajo and um, that was, you know, um, a critical question they said, you know, is that, you know, how do we know that we're understanding the definitions of what's healthy and unhealthy foods? And um, how do we apply it to our coding system? So uh, as um, advocates, we put together a, um, a listing of healthy foods and a listing of unhealthy foods and what should be taxable and non-taxable. So um, to, that was to help both, you know, the consumer and um, the store owners. All right. And then we've got another question here. Um, this sounds like it's a two-part question. Um, this person says, super interesting, pre super interesting presentation, Gloria. Thank you. I have two questions. You seem to... You seem to have had a very focused approach to getting support from council. You mentioned visiting 51 chapters. How strategic were you in choosing which chapters to visit? Mostly large, mostly small, or a combination? And then the second question is, I noticed in the chart towards the beginning of the presentation that you note the state and county administrator's food code. How much is a Navajo food code a strategy that you folks are considering as part of the overall approach to an independent Diné food system? Okay, um, let's see. Let me address the first question first. Um, and can you give maybe just a, a more... Um, shortened version of that question <laughs> yeah sure absolutely um she asks um that you mentioned visiting 51 chapters how strategic oh. were you in choosing which chapters to visit so were they mostly large small or a combination between most mostly large or small um yeah we we took a look at the 110 um chapters and um it's because, you know, we were advocates serving um, many of the 110 chapters. We took a look at uh, number one priority chapters were those chapters where the, their council delegates were in opposition with the 2% tax. And so, you know, those were the ones we had to make sure we went in there and got a support resolution to make sure that when we go back to council, and then that particular delegate votes again no, or they have questions, you know, in any of the standing committee presentations, we were able to address and uh, say, but, you know, that's not what your chapter, um, you know, is agreeing that, you know, they, they supported 
this tax with a resolution, but yet, yeah, you're in the council here saying that you don't support it. And that happened a few times, you know, when we went back to council. And so um, that was our priority of selecting certain chapters. And then um, just by looking at um, the various chapters, um, if there were um, various advocates from certain chapters, you know, we tried to spread out the work. And so it wasn't so much, is that a small chapter or is that a big chapter? Um, because, you know, we just try to get into as many chapters as we could in a short period of time. And so it wasn't just a matter of looking at small and big chapters, but the other big key um, resolutions that we passed was with uh, what we call the five agency Navajo councils. And those councils uh, consist of all the elected chapter officials, the president, vice president, the secretary, um, and then the council delegates. And they might even be grazing um, um, chairmen or uh, farm board presidents. Um, they all go to these um, agency council meetings every three months and they pass certain kinds of res resolutions that go into the council. So we ended up getting four of the five agency council resolutions so that all the um, elected chapter community people officials were um, educated and um, the majority voted to support the 2% tax. So that's how we tried to cover all the elected officials, you know, for the first round of voting on the 2% tax. And then of course we took in the um, chapter resolutions to those agency council meetings. The second question, um, and please refresh my mind on that second question. That seemed to be a long one too. Sure. Um, it says that she noticed at the chart towards the beginning of the presentation, they note state and county administrators food code. And then she asks, how much is a Navajo food code a strategy that you had considered as part of the overall approach to an independent Diné food system? That see the biggest challenge um, because we're looking at working with three state governments, probably about um, five federal agencies, and then uh, 20 counties on Navajo. And all of them have certain kinds of maybe food regulations, food safety, uh, concerning food safety or um, distribution, and uh, even schools have procurement processes and so on like that. So there's a, you know, this is the, the huge part of looking at the food policy um, of the Navajo Nation. And um, I wanted to make a mention that um, we work closely with um, Vice President Nez on his um, food summit. And then he made monthly visits out to um, communities doing different kinds of agriculture or food sovereignty um, efforts. And so he says, let's work on that food policy. Uh, we're going to recruit um, the University of Arkansas's Indigenous Agriculture Department, um, the food lawyer over there. Uh, she used to work for USDA. And then we're going to try to bring as many people to the table um, county people, federal people, um, tribal divisions, um, anybody that can help us move and make the food policy and then start ticking away at like food safety, you know, um, um, school lunches, school procurement purchases for local food. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a big question and we're trying to organize that on Navajo and include all the many different partners to come to the table. And so Vice President has set up a food policy committee. Okay, great. Well, um, with that, uh, it is approaching the top of the hour here. So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, again, we uh, want to thank um, Gloria and Begay for presenting for us today. If you had any additional questions for her, feel free to shoot her an email, um, stargazer.begay at gmail.com. Also, um, again, we're going to try to uh, get everything archived and up on the website within the hour here. 
Um, if you are looking to uh, review the webinar again or share it with a colleague that may have missed it today, um, go ahead and uh, direct them to cupidsacred.org. And if you look at the left menu bar on the website, we do have a webinar archive tab there. So go ahead and click that and we should have it up there. Um, if not today, then within the next 24 hours for sure. And then also feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up and wish everybody a wonderful day. Thank you.